Welcome to the Psychegeist and Behavioral Change, Behavior Change for Good Behavioral Science Author Series. This is our third uh, installment of the fall season and third and last installment of the fall season. Um, for those of you who don't know about uh, Psychegeist uh, Media, we are a brand new nonprofit started this year. Uh, we help behavioral scientists share their research uh, with the public, including, uh, including Max um, and his new book. Um, Speaking of Max, Max Bazerman is the Jesse Isidore Strauss Professor of Business, Business Administration at Harvard Business School. He's the author of several books um, on negotiation and decision making, as well as business uh, ethics, uh, including most recently uh, Decision Leadership with our friend Don Moore and Better Not Perfect, uh, which will be relevant to our uh, discussion of complicity today. Um, speaking of Don Moore, uh, Don was one of Max's students, and you may recognize a bunch of the people that uh, Max has mentored, including uh, BCFG's own Katie Milkman, uh, Todd Rogers, Madupi Akinola, our guest last week, uh, Dolly Chug, uh, as well. Um, I want to note for our audience that there is a Q&A uh, portion that you're welcome to contribute questions for uh, below that we'll be doing in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes of our, our talk. Um, but I, I'm going to take uh, the lead with the questions uh, uh, about uh, Max's new book, uh, Complicit, which is out on Tuesday. Um, so Max, welcome. I'm delighted to uh, be talking with you today. Thank um, you for inviting me to join you. Yeah, our, our, our pleasure. Um, where I thought we could start uh, was uh, with the origins of research on business ethics uh, at business schools, which you had sort of placed at, at around 20 years ago when the uh, Enron ha scandal happened and people wanted to understand uh, why or how that sort of thing could happen. Great, so uh, hopefully we won't lose people who don't like history very much. And, and this is, but this is my very abbreviated history that if we go um, through the last millennium, um, business schools largely ignored the topic of ethics. Um, and then <clears throat> um, Enron collapses and the world turns to business schools and, and basically says, what are you going to do about the fact that you're creating these bad people? And so the first thing people th uh, think about is how do we stop the, the Jeff Skillings and Ken Lays and Bernie Madoffs from even appearing? And I think the truth of the matter is that uh, few of us in the social science community have good answers to the question of how the, to keep the bad guys from emerging. So what social scientists did as we moved into the topic of ethics is we focused on the bad behavior by perfectly good people. Um, so rather, rather than pursuing the bad apples notion, we looked at everyday, ordinary, unethical behavior that even good people uh, engage in without even being aware that you're doing it. Um, my, my current view and what, what I provide in Complicit is maybe we left the, the really bad guys too quickly. And while I don't think I know how to reform them, what I, what I observe across whatever scandal you wanna pick, whatever mini series you watched recently, whatever media you read, whatever book you might have, have read, um, is that the really critical harm doers couldn't do what they engaged in without the complicit behavior of so many people around them. And so what complicit is all about is um, retelling stories that everybody watching already knows, okay? But retelling these stories, not from the perspective of Elizabeth Holmes, but from the perspective of the Theranos board and the Walgreens executives who brought this um, fraudulent technology into their stores. So um, across lots and lots of different stories, I focus on the fact that all of us have a role to play in keeping the truly bad behavior from occurring. And the key is to figure out how we could be less complicit in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we'll get to this question of, of, um, of our own role, because we don't like to think of ourselves as complicit, but there are many ways in which we can uh, we can rec recognize our, our own potential complicity in systems. But you lay out this taxonomy of different levels, different um, 
across the spectrum of, uh, of, of complicity. And so I thought we'd start with kind of the obvious complicity, the people who we, could, we, we, don't, we don't generally let off the hook quite as much that we think of as, as sort of obviously complicit. Uh, yeah, so, tell, yeah, so tell us about that. Yeah, so the, so the book talks about seven different profiles of complicity, two of which focus on uh, intentional complicity. People who, knew, who know that they're doing something wrong, it's just that they're um, neglecting concern for the rest of us. So it's selfish, often um, inappropriate and or illegal behavior. So you can think of people who are true partners with the core harm doer. So there were certainly employees um, at Purdue Pharmaceutical, um, who knew exactly what they were doing, and they they collaborate, and they were, were partners of the of Richard Sackler in turbocharging um, the, uh, the sales of uh, uh, of opioids. But there were also collaborators. So a collaborator I would think of as McKinsey Consult Consulting, um, who wasn't sharing in the profit, but they were being paid very extensive consulting fees. Um, in order to share best strategies on how do you turbocharge opioid sales. So both true partners and collaborators have intentionality about them. And there are certainly um, what uh, the, the profiles that lead most of us to say, but I don't, I'm not complicit. Um, right. And when we move to the other five profiles, that's when we begin, when I begin to question, certainly for myself, whether or not I'm innocent of any complicity at all. Yeah, so we'll have a story about, about yourself uh, reflecting on your own complicity, but those other five profiles, that's where I wanted to, to start with, uh, starting uh, in the order that you presented in the book with uh, benefiting from privilege. Uh, sure. How that, that can make you complicit. So I think we have a lot of academics who are watching, but, but I think we can all um, Sort of resonate with um, one of one of the core issues uh, and one of the core stories that I talk about in that chapter on benefiting from from pr privilege. Um, when I look at um, higher education universities, and I love universities, and I think that universities create lots of good. But if you ask me, what's the most obvious thing that they do that thirty years from now we'll look back and see as unethical and inappropriate behavior? Legacy admissions jumps jumps out. So these these institutions who claim to be meritocratic give preference, not not all universities, but many, unfortunately, including my own, give preference to the children of alum alumni, um, to the children of um, faculty, um, to the children of very wealthy donors, and I have a hard time justifying this behavior at all. But for me, the interesting question is why so many of my colleagues at Harvard and elsewhere remain relatively quiet about this topic. And I think part of the answer is that we benefit and we're, and we're not instituting these policies that I'm calling unethical, but we're benefiting from them. And I think we're often too quiet about bad behavior because we're the beneficiaries of that bad behavior. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can, you know, my, my oldest kid is, uh, is only 11, but, uh, but it, yeah, it seems like, well, but, why, why mess but, with a system that, that, uh, that is good for, good for me. And University of Chicago tuition is awfully high these days. Yeah, so, no, yeah. absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I thought it also speaks a little bit to this, this, um, Way, ways that we rationalize our complicity, where it's it's not really my job to change this this system. Uh, I guess I could say something, but I'll let somebody else handle the problem. Exactly, and and we'll uh, we'll probably come back to the psychology of complicity later on. But but I, you're already highlighting one piece of the psychology. We hold people accountable when they're complicit for taking an action. We typically don't hold people sufficiently accountable from my perspective when the, when the ethical lapse is an error of omission or right. not and, acting in some way. And that, that, goes, that goes the same for, for judging other people as, as sort of reflecting on, on our own behavior, for sure. Absolutely. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the whistleblowers at Theranos uh, in, uh, towards the end of our, our, our chat. But uh, the next chapter was uh, false prophets, and I thought that was a, a, uh, 
Uh, Theranos was was one great example of where people followed uh, followed the prophet in this way and became complicit. Yeah. So um, so a, 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 um, a lot of people who follow um, the behavioral change for good um, uh, uh, ideas um, know about system one versus system two thinking or intuition versus deliberative thought. And one of the reasons that people become complicit is they basically start to believe in false prophets. And you can either think of Jim Jones, who basically had his the members of the People's Temple commit suicide by allegedly drinking the Kool-Aid. It was actually flavor aid. Um, but I think we see the same behavior um, at places like Theranos, um, where Elizabeth Holmes became kind of a new age visionary, Adam Newman at WeWork, where, um, where for-profit institutions create norms of um, treating their leader as a prophet. And to question the leader is viewed as hearsay. Um, and um, I think it's fine to be loyal to, it, to a person, to an organization, but when the leader wants you to suppress your thoughts and trust your faith rather than deliberative action, then I think we begin to have a significant problem. So I think that um, sort of another profile that we're talking about yeah. is having, uh, having belief in a false prophet um, that, that shouldn't exist in a for-profit corporation, but we see it occur on a pretty regular basis. Um, and so for me, that also sort of bleeds into the, right, a loyalty to a false prophet. Uh, you talk about loyalty to authority uh, as well. Um, Absolutely. So, um, so if we think about um, sort of the, the, the sexual abuse that occurred at Penn State or Michigan State or within the Catholic Church, and we think about how did so many respected people not act on sort of lots of information that children were being assaulted and raped. How could this possibly happen? And um, I think that many people become um, loyal to their organization and respectful of the authority within that organization so that they essentially put blinders on. It's almost hard to believe right. that so many well-respected people could look the other way when children are being raped within the organization. Yet we've seen this in multiple um, multiple situations. In, in all these situations, um, there's this enormous respect and loyalty toward the organization that I think gets in the way of acting. Similarly, there's um, now lots of um, material coming out on Harvey Weinstein and and many uh, other sexual predators and and part of the amazingness of the Harvey Weinstein story is how so many people knew what were knew what was going on who escorted his victims to his hotel room um, and that this could go on for so long with nobody taking any action at all. Um, I, I'm always inspired by Josh Green's book, Moral Tribes, where he focuses on sort of the amazing we give to our own group. And I think yeah. that sort of giving too much respect to our institution can grow out of that in a way that can lead us to engage in behavior that we would not be particularly proud of. Yeah, and you, you can see that sort of that profile and complicity uh, there's the, the Weinstein example that you, you, uh, you were just raising where it literally is, in, he's the final piece of a whole system, uh, that that's enabling that he, he it was, would be completely impossible. Certainly on the scale, uh, of the, of the crimes he committed, this would be impossible without other people, uh, getting involved. And, and I'm arguing that that's true of every story I feature in the book, and there's a lot of stories, mm -hmm. that, that the core harm doer couldn't do what they did. Yeah. No, um, absolutely. Without, I think that, without the complicity yeah. of the people around them. Um, so the next, the next uh, form of ordinary complicity uh, comes with a personal story. So this, was, this, this one is um, trusting in your relationships, that 
right? As uh, as right, it was uh, Reagan who, who said, "Trust, trust, but verify. Trust, but without verifying." Um, so how does how does because trust in in your relationship seems like a pretty positive thing to have. In fact, we'll talk about how it can help uh, on the whistleblowing side. Um, but it seems positive, but it can get you in trouble. Uh, tell us a bit more about that and, and go into uh, into your own story as you like. Sure. So, so first of all, I started writing Complicit after the insurrection or coup on January 6, 2021. Okay. And I was stunned by how there could be so many people, people who I might not have agreed with politically, but I would have never suspected that they would have supported white supremacy and the destruction of democracy at the level that they actually did. And um, so th that was kind of the core observation that triggered writing this book. And, and quite honestly, I've never had a book that has um, come out of me so quickly. So these stories just kind of flew out. And um, we moved to the summer of 2021. Um, and um, unfortunately, I, I get information that my uh, 20, uh, 2012 paper that I wrote, um, where I'm the fifth author on, on the idea of if you sign a document before you fill it out, you're more likely to tell the truth, that datacolada.org has kind of amazing evidence that the paper is fraudulent. And, you know, I look at their evidence and um, I'm just persuaded that my name happens to be on a paper with fraudulent data. And um, when I look back at, at the episode, I, I, can, I can, kind of, I tried to figure out my own complicity because sort of if I'm gonna be reading about all these scandals and all of a sudden I'm in the middle of a scandal, um, it seems appropriate to take a look at my own behavior. So, so chapter seven is on trust and relationships and how it can lead to complicity. And I do my best to retell that story um, on how did I end up in this situation? So, um, you know, I, I think research integrity is a shockingly important issue. And here, my name is on a paper that's getting a lot of visibility um, for the fraudulent behavior. And, you know, if I look back on it, um, if I go back to, you know, a decade ago when the paper was in creation, um, there were lots of signs that something was wrong. And, and, you know, the email chain among the five co-authors of the paper makes it very clear that, I'm, that, that kind of I was the one asking lots of critical questions and even questioning the data. Um, but at the time, the lead author was my doctoral advisee on the job market presenting this data. And, um, and when I kept on pushing about some problems that I saw, when I got answers that had some reasonableness to them, I quit pushing. Okay. Yeah. So, what are the, so what are the things that I did back then that I regret? Well, I didn't push hard enough to get clarity. I didn't spend an hour looking at the data myself. Now it's become very common for um, empirical researchers as they become more senior to rely on junior colleagues to do a variety of the pieces of the work. Um, I regret that. I regret, I regret that I became so distant from the data. So I, I, I do think that those of us who put our names on the paper should be comfortable with the data at a, at a more detailed level than I was. So the question is, how did this happen? And I think the answer is, I trusted people, okay? And, and I wanna to continue to trust people, but I think that we can create systems where we trust, but as you suggested earlier, <clears throat> but, but that we verify. And it might even be healthy if our journal editors and our department shows made it the norm Mm -hmm. that we want authors to be close enough to the data that they're comfortable with the ethicality of the data so that it becomes normal rather than peculiar to question your co-authors about some details of the data. <coughs> right, Excuse so that me. you can attest, you're asked to attest that you've looked at the data, you've, you've considered the data uh, yourself, 
and and asking to look at the data doesn't seem like you're you're questioning the integrity of the person. Exactly. Uh, exactly. But I think I was on a motivated search, even when I had critical questions, to get acceptable answers. And you know, and after I got those answers, we published a paper. I go on to believe this result. So I advised lots of people to, to move the signature to the top. Um, and it was my work with a consulting client um, by a company's name is Slice um, that led me to think that, um, that uh, figuring out how to get people to tell the truth online was an interesting research topic. It was that project coming back into the lab as a basic research topic separate from the consulting work with Slice that basically led to the failure to replicate that we document um, in a 2020 yeah. paper led by Ariella um, Crystal. Um, so, so it, it, I mean, it's, it's very clear that not only was I complicit in allowing somebody else to fool the world, but I fooled myself as well in this process mm -hmm. by looking for the right data through a trusting process. Mm -hmm. Although I will say uh, to your credit, right, you could have swept it under the rug instead of running lots of replications uh, in the years that followed, um, that, that would have been would have been a pretty normal way to to just put out of sight, out of mind uh, uh, worries yeah. that, you, that you might. Have yeah. Had. So so I I would highlight that Ariella, um, and Crystal, and Ashley Willens were the leaders of the failure to replicate project. They weren't they were not authors on the original paper. Right. Um, and and so I, I don't think I could have. Um, I, um, I would not want have have wanted to coerce them to suppress the data. And, and I hope that I wouldn't have wanted to suppress the data, even in terms of my own interest. I, I think that you know the research reform movement is a critical change in social science, and I'm all for it. So um, you know, I, I'm 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 happy that we've been able to correct the scientific record. So, given that we are we are uh, tight on time, I wanted to move to two other topics. Uh, one uh, was the psychology, and then the second was like, what what can we actually do about this? Uh, so let's start with the psychology. Uh, let me take you back to Theranos again because you have a, a great uh, anecdote about uh, asking uh, <coughs> executives who was who was responsible uh, for for the fraud at Theranos. Yeah, so um, so I was teaching a group of very senior executives. Um, they, they were um, in a Harvard Business School program for many weeks, and um, prior to the to the um, question that I asked them, they had read a detailed and excellent case on Theranos, and they had had an eighty-minute discussion of Theranos, and the um, and the um, case. And the discussion covered the fact that um, Elizabeth Holmes had a romantic and business partner in Sonny Balwani, um, who looks like he'll soon be headed to jail. Um, <clears throat> they read about the completely incompetent, um, very old board of directors who completely failed to ask appropriate questions. They knew about Walgreens, who had executives who were fearful of being beaten out by CVS for a deal with Theranos, who put this equipment into their pharmacies um, when, they're, when the technology just couldn't pass any kind of reasonable due diligence. Um, and Walgreens even had a consultant um, on technical issues who kept warning them that you shouldn't trust Theranos and they just ignored their consultant. Um, they they were, were kind of mindless and bringing the technology into, um, in, into their pharmacies. And um, so these students had, were kind of familiar with all these details. And I simply started a um, Zoom class with the question, what was the cause of the crisis at Theranos? And I asked everybody um, without sending to put their answer into um, the chat box and send at the same time. Um, and, um, and everybody who's listening can think about your answer to that question. And um, what's interesting is the vast majority of the answers were consistent with um, Anne McGill's early research on single sourcing of blame, where they provided me with one simple answer. So I gave them plenty of time to answer my question, but I typically got one answer. 
And the answer focused on Elizabeth Holmes' ethics yeah. or, or her ego. Okay. But the, all the other causes were rarely mentioned. Um, and I think that this notion that, we, that when we look for the cause of a bad event, we look for a single cause. And if we're going to look for a single cause, it makes complete sense that the core harm doer is um, the, the person that we're going to end up focusing on. But, but the problem with that is single sourcing of blame takes all of the rest of us off of the hook yeah. from our role um, in not being complicit. So, so I think that the psychology of single sourcing of blame is critical to why the complicit have been ignored for so long and why we focus on the core name that has become visible. And I think that it's not just, um, reg it's not just those of us who are in the organization, but I think the media does the same thing. The, the mm -hmm. amount of attention that the media focuses on the core, core harm doer sort of exacerbates this tendency as well. So, so single sourcing of blame is at least one piece of the psychology that I think drives what's going on here. And it's, it's, it's easier, right, to blame one person than to figure out exactly the degree of, of, uh, uh, of uh, wrong done by all these other people who <laughs> sometimes, right, the other, one of the other elements of the psychology you talked about is, is omission, right? They just didn't, they didn't do what they should have done. And it's a lot easier to, to blame Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth Holmes than, than tell the board that they should have they should have known that this was obvious. There were so many red flags, they should have noticed them. Exactly. So um, while there's a chapter on the psychology of complicity, and we, there are a variety of factors, the two big ones, um, I think, are single sourcing of blame and the fact that we ignore errors of omission. And and the problem with this behavior isn't just how we attribute blame, but if we admit, ignore errors of omission, we're not going to solve the problem of how to stop the wrongdoers in the future. Right, which I which I'd like to I, I hope we can get to either either now or in the in the audience uh, in the audience Q and A. Um, so before we get to to organizational changes, um, what about? The ordinary person, the person listening today, who might want to stop and think about where they're, um, where they they might be uh, <coughs> complicit in something. Where do you where do you start? How do you how do you think about this? I, I think about, about it by thinking about who do I want to be. So um, if if I sort of end up reading about a story in the newspaper about my organization, do I want to be somebody who? ignored the problem and went along with it, or do I want to be someone who spoke up? And um, I'm answering that question for myself, and I want to be the person who spoke up. So I think thinking about it, not in the middle of the episode, but in advance, is puts us on the right pathway. Um, I think that we can reduce the risk of speaking up by being excellent in our organization. The more important we are to, the, to our organization, the more credits we have that allow us to speak up. Um, I think we can often check in with friends of ours, and this goes back to the Tyler Schultz, Erica Chung episode, um, across many stories from um, data fraud stories in the past um, to um, the Theranos story. Um, junior people often come forward when they have a partner who will speak mm -hmm. up with them. And, um, and that's the case in fairness. So basically Tyler Schultz is talking to his friend, Erica Chung, who's also a, a, um, sort of at Theranos. And by having a partner, it tells you you're not alone. You're not, you're not crazy in what you're seeing. It's actually kind of happening. Um, one of my <laughs> favorite stories as I close the book um, comes from a, a friend of mine I, I, who I was hiking with in the woods as a kind of 98% done with the book. And he was asking me what is working about working on and I was telling him about uh, complicit. And he told me this kind of wonderful story where, you know, he's a senior executive at a financial organization that we've all heard of. And it's, he's in a, a committee doing high level review of executives. And this one person being talked about is getting kind of very positive statements. And he's feeling queasy about 
the discussion because he's heard multiple rumors that this guy was harassing junior female colleagues. And finally, he decides that he has to say, but should we be concerned about the rumors of his sexual harassment? And once he mentions it, mm-hmm. it just like it just opens up the discussion, and everyone else in the room was having similar concerns with independent information. And once this information was exposed, then very quickly this person um, left the organization in the not too distant future. And I honestly don't have the details of this. Uh, I don't know who this person is. I don't know exactly how the accident occurred. But the key issue is that maybe you have an obligation to speak up when this person, um, when you've heard about multiple episodes of this person um, harassing um, junior colleagues. So uh, I I think of that as just kind of a role model of what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and speaking up can can be hard when you're not sure uh, and there's there are consequences. There can be consequences uh, for speaking up. And yeah. so, returning to the point about talking to your friends, I think it's it both can give you courage, but it can also, like you're saying, you know that you somebody's there to to verify for you that that you're not crazy, um, because you can get right. That's what happens often is that you're told that you're crazy. Um, but also, as you're saying, there's a lot of information that goes unspoken that everybody often has their own private reservations. Um, yep. and, but and until they hear all, that other people have them. Yeah, and I'm not arguing that at the first sign of something might yeah. be wrong, you're supposed to speak up. I'm yeah. arguing at the first sign some, that something might be wrong, you should think more, you should deliberate, you should develop yeah. a strategy, you should ask, is there a way I can learn more information right. Uh, right. about this and then make your de- make your determination with more information in front of you. Right. And I I think what you're pointing to, too, is that one of the keys to that deliberation is, if possible, not to do it by yourself, um, but to do it absolutely with a friend. Um, So you were talking about systemic uh, systemic solutions to this as well. So you were just mentioning um, uh, when you see what you see multiple um, multiple cases. Um, But sometimes, as we were just talking about, you don't know if there's multiple cases because you see your own perspective. And if you don't say anything, everybody else who has their their own cases um, that they've seen doesn't know that they that what you've seen. Um, So uh, you you talked about in the book some of these approaches uh, to sexual harassment allegations that try to try to solve this problem uh, of not ringing the alarm bell at the first sign of a problem, but making sure that not every uh, every sign of a problem gets suppressed. Yeah, so so Ian Ayers um, and a, a colleague who's, uh, I'm blocking on her name and I apologize for that, um, but they have this idea of information escrow. And the notion is um, the University of Chicago could set up a system and they may well have because a number of universities have, but in, in the way an information escrow system works is you create an online system where somebody who's been assaulted can report that episode to a a computerized system that will remain private until the same assaulter is reported by a different assaultee. So the idea is um, that since we know that people who assault um, other students on campus um, tend to do it on on a pretty regular basis and a lot of the assaults come from a very small number of people yeah that um, if we created a system where someone who's been assaulted can report this and knows that they will not be coming forward alone that may give people more power and more comfort in moving forward when something inappropriate occurs and you can apply this well outside the sexual assault domain of course so i'm going to move now to taking some questions from uh from the audience um, one of the things that has come up a couple of times here now um, are, are people asking about hindsight bias um, and and whether errors of omission, when you look back and say, oh, I should have known, um, how much of that, uh, is it fair to think that people should have known uh, and how much of it is hindsight bias? Well, I, 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 um, I, I'll claim guilt by the fact that I use historic stories 
um, in the book. So is it possible that there's hindsight bias? The answer has to be yes to that. So, so I'll, I'll just go with, I might have hindsight bias, but I, I want to use the ideas in the book in a very um, future oriented way rather than with hindsight. So I'm not, so I don't, I don't really want to um, hammer the listeners over their heads with the notion you've been complicit in the past. I'm really interested in not being complicit in the future. So, mm -hmm. um, so if you, I, I could, I could go through sort of my personal episodes. There's a number of personal episodes um, that I tell in the book, um, and in each of these, um, there might be some hindsight, but I think that I had enough information in the stories I tell about myself in the book to say I should have done something differently f far earlier in that story. So, so, um, so there's some I, element I of it, but it doesn't obviate. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So, so if, if it's a methodological critique of a academic paper, um, I, I see the point. But I'm, I'm, I, I, do I want to back off of, of any of my arguments because of the potential for hindsight in the stories? Not at all. Yeah. Um, speaking of looking to the future, uh, Inav Hart asks, asks about um, climate change and whether we could, uh, we could apply any of the principles of, of complicity to, to climate change. We're all participating in a system that is contributing to that problem. I think she's answering the question very, very, very nicely. So, you know, I think we could all evaluate our own behavior and, you know, and, and see that there's changes that we can make. There may be a limit to the sacrifices that we're willing to make, but the, the, the more harm we're creating, the more we're taking away our own voice from critiquing other parties. So, you know, part of the reason that other countries aren't too thrilled with being told what to do by the United States and other developed economies is that they look at us and say, we're, we, you know, developed economies created this problem, particularly the United States, and they should step forward and provide the lion's share of the solution. So I think that our complicity is critically important across. You can pick the problem, and I think that our complicity um, is important in why we haven't done more. So one of the one of the challenges that arise, arises for me that I think you address in a previous book is that almost everything I do makes me complicit in some way with the system that, yeah. that supports climate change. And so you wrote a, a book recently called Better Not Perfect that speaks to this idea of it's if we try to be perfect, we can kind of throw up our hands and say, look, I'm not, I have I have a job I need to drive to. I have to I'm going to fly and see my family. I'm not going to take a I'm not going to walk. Um, and so uh, talk a little bit about how in the face of the dauntingness of not being complicit at all, you can be less complicit. Sure. Uh, I, I, I think you just, I, you sort of answered your, the question, but I'll, I'll babble on a, a little bit about it. So yeah, my, my, my notion of helping myself and other people be more ethical is to encourage all of us to be better rather than aim for perfection. So philosophers give us the answer to what would the most ethical behavior be from a variety of different perspectives. Um, I'm personally a fan of Peter Singer and utilitarianism, um, but the standards are too high. So to make all of my decisions so that they're um, ethical from a utilitarian perspective is simply too demanding. So you know, my goal for myself is um, to be more ethical in 2023 than I was in 2022 and, and mm -hmm. continue and keep on going. And similarly, um, you know, there are times when I expect that I will be complicit in something that's wrong in some organization, or I'll try an intervention to improve things and it won't work. Um, and I'll stop rather than continuing to badger um, some individuals over a problem that's important, but not critically important. So, so I don't expect that I'm going to eliminate my complicity, but I think that I would like to deliberate much more about critical challenges that I see around me and to become less complicit in the future than I have been in the past, which as I documented in the book should be relatively easy to do since I can identify too much complicity in my own behavior, even though in none of the stories that I tell was I intentionally trying to do anything harmful. 
So that actually brings us to, I think, what will probably end up being our last question um, it is about, uh, about intent or perceived intent. So uh, let me just read the question. When you think about allocating blame for complicity versus instigation, how do you think of the role of perceived intent? Are people prone to single sourcing blame because only the instigator, the Holmes or the Weinstein, is seen as having the truly bad intention? Yeah. Um, so I don't agree with the premise of the question. So I, I think that there, there, there are people who are collaborators, who are mm -hmm. partners and collaborators um, who have intentionality to them. In fact, the book is structured around two types of intentional complicity and five types of ordinary complicity or indirect complicity that people may not be aware of. So I, so I think that, that we tend to focus on the harm doer and not even on the partners or the collaborators. But if we do go to the collaborators, we focus on the intentional ones. And I think that that's consistent with um, the extremity of the complicity, but I, I think it's also consistent with legal issues. So I think that the intentional complicitors are more likely to have legal culpability than the um, ordinary complicitors. But if our goal is to make the world a better place, um, I don't think we should stop by simply improving uh, well, in reducing the intentional complicitors, I think we want to uh, move toward the ordinary complicitors as well. And that brings in the rest of us, including myself. So that uh, brings us near the end of our time. Uh, I wanted to throw it back to you for one more sort of uh, for a final thought uh, before we uh, before we sign off. Thank you, Dave. Um, so yeah, uh, so I like talking. So uh, thanks for chatting with me, Dave. And, and I my tend pleasure. to not like reading, but um, I, I'm going to read for my closing thought, and I'm going to read um, the closing chapter, uh, the closing paragraph of the book, because um, I think it captures what, for me, is the for the personal takeaway from going through this process of writing this book over the last year and a half. Um, I hope that if I had had access in 2011 to the knowledge I have now about complicity, that I would have done more to stop the data fraud described in chapter seven. The data fraud story highlights a final message for avoiding complicity. When something is wrong, we must not accept the easiest explanation. We need to be persistent until we fully understand what's going on. Sometimes this puts our relationships at risk. Sometimes it will be uncomfortable, but it's the ethical thing to do. And with that, I hope, for, uh, I hope that I can change my own behavior and that of other people who might be listening. Well, thank you. I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. I also want to really thank uh, Alex Lusher from B, uh, BCFG and I Izzy Heck from, uh, from Psychice for their support uh, today. Uh, thanks to all of BCFG, starting with uh, Katie Milkman and Angela Duckworth for, uh, for uh, supporting this series. And thanks to all of you uh, for listening today. And this is our last uh, installment of the fall season. We'll be back in uh, January of 2023 with a new season, starting with Annie Duke, the author of, uh, of Quit. Um, really appreciate everybody joining us. The recordings uh, you can find in the chat for the, earlier, uh, for the earlier chats, and this one will also be available uh, within a matter of, uh, of a few days. Thanks again so much, Max, for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Bye.